Do, have you ever heard my first day on the wire? No, oh my no, God, no. crazy story. I, I, so it's like I'm, I'm going to my first day of big work on an HBO show. I've been waiting for this day forever. I slept through my alarm. You're kidding me. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Tom. Nice to have you here. I was, I was very excited about the. So you were talking to Mary earlier, the the Master Chef. Yep. And you you made the Master Chef Master Chief connection. I did well only because we've been confused for each other, you know, quite often. <laughs> you know? When when you walked in, I was like, oh, is he going to cook up some sausages and gnocchi? But no, that's you know, right. Okay, no, good. no, I'm just here to just just be Master Chief. Yeah, sometimes I spell it wrong on social media, <laughs> <laughs> and people are like, oh, you're the Master Chef. Okay, so yeah, I had to point that out when I went to see. Um, I, I tell you what I find interesting about video game adaptations is that they are so. So video games as like a as a property are, I mean, massive, massive uh, money makers. You know, yeah. you have stuff like Red Dead Redemption and Halo and yeah. you know The Last of Us. These things making you know kajillions of dollars, outgrossing your, your your biggest blockbuster movies. But if you're not in that world, it's easy not to know anything about it. Yeah. When you find yourself talking to people and you're like, oh, I'm in, I'm in Halo, and you realize that they haven't played the game, what do you, what do you do? What do you say to them? You know, Halo is one that almost everybody knows, okay. at least by visual association. You know? Right, right. I, all I usually have to say is like the green guy. You know? <laughs> it's the green guy and the blue lady. Right. And everybody knows some version of it. But um but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we're, we're doing a video game adaptation, but hopefully we're telling a human story. That's obviously the goal, right? And the approach in, of this show from from the people who who hired me was to tell the story of the Master Chief closely associated with um, the story of John, who's the guy under the armor, right? And, and that story is equally important to kind of... Um, Newcomers, uh, especially, you know, in in terms of of bringing people along for the journey. Talk to me a little bit more about that because you're yeah. right. I mean, from from playing Halo, um, you know, sort of in your college years, you mm-hmm. don't know a lot about the Master Chief. He's just, you know, he's sort of a. And that's entirely intentional, right? Like it's a video game character created so that you can feel like you're him. So he's created as a bit of a blank slate. He's he's uh, stoic. He doesn't say much. He's strong, uh, heroic. And a lot of the the other parts of his personality are left for you to fill in with parts of your personality, so you can right, feel like you're that right. guy. Right? That's why he's sort of a blank slate. That's so it. You can, That's feel, it. you can feel like that person. That's right. the thing. Okay. But also, then you know the the important elements of his character: heroism, nobility, uh, moral compass. Right. Those are the things that we know him for, uh, and those are the the aspects of the character that you have to hit, obviously, in order to make him feel familiar. But the interesting part then is that because so many people have played him, uh, played the game and played as him, you have millions and millions of people who who see the character as a version of themselves. So like they feel an ownership of the character? Absolutely. Huge ownership. And I, you know, as somebody who played Halo, I, I feel that as well. Uh, and so, you know, to play the character then on television and, and when part of the setup of the show is uh, adding to the Halo universe by taking off the helmet for the first time and seeing the character underneath the armor, you get the opportunity to explore the character in a way that you never did in the video games and add to the, to the universe. And you also face some backlash from, you know, people who are resistant to the idea of seeing what's under the armor. And I think partly because we all have this idea of him as ourselves. Let me, I got, I got two questions on that. So uh, first off, um, again, I, I, you're right. I know the stoic heroism of the Master mm-hmm, Chief, mm-hmm. but when you come in, like, you know, what are those human elements that you want to bring out in the story that you're faced with the story when you sign on to take it on? Well, you know, in terms of the the human elements of the character who's developing, he's sort of, especially in first season, he's kind of in his infancy of of human experience. Right. The setup for us is that he takes off this uh, this pellet that was an emotional regulation pellet. So he's really experiencing things as a human for the first time. So that's, that's an aspect of kind of like the clean slate and, and, and seeing things with new eyes and fresh eyes in terms of what turned me on about the project and what is interesting for me about the project. Um, I've done a lot of military theme movies. I've done a lot of training for military theme movies. And so now I have a lot of friends who, um, you know, are past service members and current service members. And for me, one of the things that is really interesting about the story is the opportunity to tell, um, a story about the stakes and the cost of war 
to explore the idea of why we fight, you know, as, as a species, you know, and kind of where we're heading as a species, what the effects of that are, all of these things in a massive, sprawling, multi-universe, uh, futuristic epic are possible uh, to talk about in this TV show. Oh, that's so interesting because you're right. I think, I think <clears throat> that, I think that um, if I'm understanding you correctly, worst case scenario – we can think of war that those of us who 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 don't and haven't served like like myself we can think of war and conflict as a video game you know we can just think about you know uh, bad guys versus good guys and there's guns and there's stuff happening happening somewhere you have contact with service members you you become close with service members th- through your work and through this sort of futuristic um conflict based game you can show the humanity in there. You can show the complexity in there, and you can show the sort of uh, effectiveness and the cost. You know, uh, so certainly f- from a soldier's perspective, you know, every person who serves in any conflict ever basically comes home with some form of PTSD. Right? Yeah, mental yeah. health is a huge issue yeah. in in former service members. So there's that in terms of looking at the cost of war. There's also uh, you know a major through line in the universe of Halo and the larger extended universe of Halo is this idea of what aspects of humanity are positive aspects of humanity, right? And it's told through the lens of this idea of humans being reclaimers. So these uh, artifacts that you interact with along the way that uh, John has this power over to, in order to animate them and they point you towards the halo, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the Covenant, which is the, the species of aliens that, or the collection of alien species that the hum, humankind is at war against, they call the humans reclaimers because they have the ability to animate these uh, artifacts. And there's something specific about humanity that is able to reclaim these things mm-hmm. that point them towards the halo. So there's a conversation in there about which aspects of humanity are, are positive, which aspects are negative. And obviously, when you're looking at that, you're looking at back into the why do we fight category and what is it about war that is necessary for us. That's really, really fascinating. Um, and let's go back to the thing you were saying before. Um, uh, in the show, uh, the, the show gets a lot of attention famously in the in the in the first season. I mean, kind of right off the bat, when uh, the Master Chief for the first time takes the helmet off, and we see we see your face there. You said there was a little bit of something on that. People were people were giving you a hard time about it, or oh no, I, I think there's there's this a sort of mental disconnect that can come, or or uh, from people seeing the face of this character who who's never shown his face before. Yeah, and part of that disconnect, I think, is because we all have played the character, and so we feel like it's us, yeah. and that the, the the um, the incongruity of seeing somebody else's face under the helmet <laughs> is one thing. Yeah, but and that, that's supposed to be me there, you know. I think that's part of it. That's right. 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 Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah. But then, then you know, but hopefully that's that's not too much of a distraction from the larger picture. Do, do you, can you distance yourself? I know I've I've spoken to actors who have been part of, and you know, it's not just video games. Folks who have been in comic book mm. adaptations. Uh, we we don't have to get too too much into specifics. The fandom can be intense. Mm. Do you feel that? Do you, do you try to remove yourself from it? No, no, you certainly feel it. Um, and to me, it's a it's a positive. You know, it's it's one of the reasons why I took the job uh, originally is uh, I could see how engaged and how passionate the fan base was. And to me, that it really means something. You know, that there's all these people that love something so much that they will get behind their opinion vociferously, uh, you know, whatever that means and whatever that takes. And I, and I really respect and admire that. And I love all the opinions that come out of the conversation. You read them? Do you have a look? Do you look at the... It's less about reading. It's pretty odd. You know, I, I get I get confronted with them <laughs> okay, on right. social media a lot. Okay, okay, okay. And okay. It's, hard, it's hard not to see it. But but uh, at the good and the bad, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, and I take them all kind of equally because uh, it's not, for me... I'm playing a character. I don't take it personally. You know, those people aren't, they're not upset with me as a human being. They don't know me as a human being. They're, they're upset with something they're reacting to on their TV screen. That's good perspective, man. Not everyone has that kind of perspective, yeah, you know? Well. That's pretty good. Uh, a gamer yourself, do you game? Uh, I don't so much anymore. I, I played some video games when I was younger. I remember, man, um, and I never had, I had one system growing up. I had the original Nintendo. Yeah, NES. I had the original three-pack. 
I'm not sure if you remember, but it was Mario, Super Mario Brothers. Duck Hunt? Duck Hunt. Yeah. And World Class Track and Field. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And you about. had the track pad and you ran on it yeah. and jumped. Yeah. And you would cheat by using your hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my buddy, I only had the Mario and the Duck Hunt. Yeah. And my buddy James oh, had, the had the Mario and the Duck Hunt. Yeah, oh, so yeah, we man. had the track pad in so the basement. So you went over to jump at his place. Yeah, very, very exciting. Um, that was my only system. And then after that, uh, my mom got rid of that and I had to go to my friend's houses to play. So I only played Halo at my friend's houses. All right. And, and you, you're Canadian. I am. Grew yeah. up grew, uh, BC, right? Yeah, I, I could have. Hill of the Rockies. I don't know. Um, so I'm from the full other part of the. I know. From, You're from, from the East Coast. I mean, the distance between where I'm from We're and St. So John's. Far apart. I mean, you might, we, might as well, we might as well be in Warsaw. That's right. You it's, know? A, it's an entire country that could be continents. So I don't um, I don't know how to pronounce the community that you're from. Oh, uh, which one are you? What are you looking at? What letter does it start with? Why? Weimar. That's where I was born. And it wasn't even Weimar. That's like the nearest small town. I was born in a commune. Oh. At the top of the hill above Weimar called Wild Horse, B.C. What, what goes on there? Phew, you don't want to know. Really? We left when I was six months old, okay. so I didn't have to find out. Okay, so, uh, so then your family goes to, is it uh, Winlaw? Winlaw, exactly. What's going on in Winlaw? Uh, you know, good, good, healthy, wholesome stuff like farming and tree planting and uh, growing other herbs that at the time were illegal and now are not. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 right, right. Yeah. I'm familiar with those. Yeah, lots of those. No, not not oregano, but no, I'm, I'm not oregano. <laughs> Catnip, <laughs> yeah. as they say. <laughs> Savory, as we yeah. say back home. Yeah. All right, so you're you're growing up on a commune. Yeah. Uh, uh, six months you're gone. You don't really remember anything about that. No. You, you go to you go to Winlaw. What was life like there? Um, small town, you know, foothill of the Rockies. Beautiful, just such a beautiful place to grow up. Um, I, my big memories as a kid are just how clean the water was. You yeah. know. Glacial streams flowing off the mountains and great skiing, lots of powder. Um, and then my folks split when I was 12 and I moved down to Seattle and straight from B.C. where I had uh, there w- I had seen, I think, one black person in my entire life. Right. And I moved to, to central Seattle into an all black neighborhood right. and uh, just like culture shock, crazy. Uh, but great, you know, grew as a person. Kind a of lot. kind of out in the middle of the woods to right in the middle of the city, it That's sounds it. like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that when performing comes in, or were you doing some performing in Winlaw? Doing some performing in Winlaw. My my um, theater debut was uh, playing the Lorax in my third grade play. Congratulations. That my father directed. Thank you so much. It was a big moment. <laughs> they still talk about it They still Winlaw. talk about it up there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a real triumph. It's one of the heritage <laughs> minutes I've heard. <laughs> it's on the, on the TV. Yeah, yeah. Did you take to it? Were you like a duck to water? Were you... Uh, uh, I was like a Swami Swan, uh, which is one of the characters in Lorax. It was played by by some ballerinas, and uh, my father was very eager that I would help the Swami Swans up. Right. But I didn't want to touch them because they had cooties. Right. Uh, so I was like, you know, <laughs> inviting them up without touching. Um, so there was lots of that. But did, yeah, then high school, I did some plays. Did okay. you Did you love it? Like, were, were, were you? No, I liked it. It was more of a fascination for me at that point. My father was an acting teacher when I was growing up. They were like a, for for actors in the community or like a... there was a university called David Thompson University in Nelson BC and he he started the acting program there wow and then it got shut down when I was nine years old um, but I I was aware of the profession because of that mm-hmm. so I saw some of it I I loved it but it was it was more of like a curiosity I was mm-hmm. really into basketball when I was in high school and wanted to to pursue that and play that in college. But it became obvious pretty quick that I was uh, too slow and couldn't jump high enough. And I spent a year of college just kind of getting dunked on and drinking right. too much beer. And I was like, this is not working. So the goal was to, the goal, the goal was to be a, a college, sort of a college basketball player. Yeah, and, and I thought about myself like that for a while, but that, that dream was shattered. Right. And then I auditioned for acting school, took one audition at Carnegie Mellon University, which is like a four-year conservatory. Yeah. And I got in. Something felt right there. Something felt good. You know, it was more like a shot in the dark, honestly. It's funny. It's one of those moments where, like, you're just you're like, okay, I don't know what else I could do now. So I went to something I had done a little bit in high school, took a, took a shot in the dark on it. It worked out. And it ended up being this kind of thing that now when I look back, it was inevitable. You know, it's like the only thing that I could have really ended up doing. Because for me, the, the beauty of, of life as an actor is that I get the most life experience possible in the shortest amount of time. Because you get to live other people's lives. I live a new life every few months. I learn a new life. I've learned how to fly a plane. I've learned how to play hockey. I've learned how to play multiple sports. Um, You just, every few months, you get to change what you're doing. And you change the group of people you're at. It's a life of a gypsy in a way where you're kind of always moving, making new family in everything you, you do. And also, you're changing who you are. And you're adapting your 
parts of yourself to a new life, quite literally. And that for me is like, what a, what a joy to get to, ha- to get to collect as much life experience as possible in one short lifetime. What a lovely way of talking about acting. Yeah. Yeah. You get, you get to live a bunch of different lives. And yeah. Collect a bunch I think it's not bad. In, in this short life. It, it, now, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'll tell you, often am. That's uh, all right. Uh, yeah, me too. The, uh, the, the, a lot of people first acting, big acting gig, you got your Pop-Tarts commercial. Yeah. Or you're Canadian. You got your Da Vinci's Inquest. You yeah. know what I mean? You know, yeah. your, your, your CBC shows. Yeah. First, first acting gig was The Wire? TV gig? First TV acting gig was The Wire? No. This will okay. take you back. Right. Um, I mean, that, that, was my first t- that was my first TV acting okay, gig. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, so you're close. Yeah. It, it, uh, and we could just end the story there and say, oh, my God, what a great first gig. Yeah. And it was. Yeah. Absolutely. But it would be turning your back on some some really fine work that came before that. Tell me, please, 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 <laughs> illuminate me. You'd please. be missing uh, my my film debut in The Bubble Boy. Okay. Yeah, a Jake Gyllenhaal starring I picture. I think I remember The Bubble yeah, yeah, Boy. Yeah. Yeah. And I played a bright and shiny named Todd, which was the, um, you know, the group, the cult that was going across country in a bus and picked up the bubble boy on his way. And I played one of a number of Todds that picked him up and we all had big fake white teeth and it was just the craziest little job that I ever did have. Right. And it was my first. That's pretty good. That's pretty good for the first. You weren't cashier number two. That's true. That's true. I had an identity. I had a name. Did you have a line? Uh, a few. There you go. I even walked through the bus like playing a recorder. <laughs> I you mean, know, I, I mean, had a couple moments. That's so. the that's don't, that's the dream, man. Don't sell me short. Let's let's listen to the first TV acting gig. You have the chemicals. I can get them as much as you want. When? I was going to do something this week. There's been a problem though. What problem? My cousin, Ziggy. He got into a beef with these East Baltimore guys drug dealer by the name of Cheese took his car, burned it. Now he's saying he's going to dust Zig if he doesn't pay. I think he'd easy find my car. He ain't in Malacca. Yeah, Malacca. Right. Zig fucked up the package. What's really interesting is we're, we're talking to Pablo Schreiber here, and we're, we're the, the peg of why, why we're talking is we're talking about his role in um, Halo, which is an adaptation of uh, a game widely considered to be the greatest video game ever made. And, and right there you hear uh, his first TV acting gig in what a lot of people call the greatest... TV show ever made. Uh, that's Pablo Schreiber playing uh, the character Nick Sabaka in season two of The Wire. I didn't have it in my cans. I couldn't hear it. P- play it. Play it again. I'll turn your turn your headphones up a little. Oh bit. well, there you go. I had yeah. uh, this whole time. I had my own volume button. <laughs> turn, it, turn it up. There you are. Jesus. Now, now we can start the interview. Now I can hear you, Tom. <laughs> this Holy whole time. Crap. You, must have, you must have. You were really. Good. I was like, why is this guy talking so quietly? <laughs> you were very. Po- <laughs> you know, any doubt that all this time in the U.S. has <laughs> taken the Canadianness yeah. out of you? Yeah. Out. Uh, no. Because that was so. Po- Thank you for. That's very kind. I of didn't you. ask you to speak up once. No, you just. I was just like leaning in. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Play it, play a song, play the clip. Give it to me, give it to me. You have the chemicals? I can get them (laughs) as much as you want. When? I was going to do something this week. There's been a problem, though. (laughs) What problem? My cousin, Zig. Oh, Zig. He got into a beef with these East Baltimore guys. Works a lot better when you can hear the clip, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's It's a lot more fun. It's all more And we can can talk over it because you already heard it once, Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're good. We're good. Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, okay so, so, okay. so, um, what do you, because season two, was the yeah. show already widely critically acclaimed and getting no. all this talk when you walked onto the set? No? No, you're talking about The Wire. Yeah. No, not at all. No, in fact, uh, I, you know, I watched the first season, which, which was amazing, but it was really rough, like technically quite lo- yeah. rough. If you go back and watch the show, which is, I agree, one of the greatest shows of all time, and it's because of the writing. The writing is just amazing. Um, Production wise, it's it's pretty rough. Like the first season, they were still trying to figure out what the look of the show was, what the tone of the show was. It didn't feel as sort of high quality as it felt later on. Um, and I watched it, and I didn't quite I didn't quite get it. I was like, it's good, but I don't know exactly what it's about. Yeah, because so much of the wire is actually in retrospect, right? Right. Like you watch it, you're following it, mostly following it, uh, and then. It's only as the seasons pile up that you really kind of realize how genius it was. Right. right? They, 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 because they, they add on to one another with a different aspect of the life in Baltimore. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's an examination of the city of Baltimore and the causes of poverty in America that mm-hmm. takes five seasons to realize that you, that's what you've been watching. Right, 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 right. Um, so, 
So, you know, after the first season, I was just like, okay, it's a show about drug dealers and cops chasing them. Right. Um, and I was like, how do I fit into this? I don't know. Let's see. I'll just show up. And what do you remember about showing up? What do you remember about <laughs> walking onto the set? <laughs> well, uh, do you, have you ever heard my first day on the wire? No, oh my no, God, no. crazy story. I, I, so it's like I'm, I'm going to my first day of big work on an HBO show. I've been waiting for this day forever. I slept through my alarm. You're kidding me. My cell phone, it was in the early days of cell phone where I was using a cell phone as an alarm and like that was revolutionary. Was the volume down? (laughs) The battery died. The effing battery died. I wake up two hours after my call time. No. Two hours. Two You wake up two hours after your call time. Two hours after I was supposed to be on set, see the time and I'm in a just a panic. I'm like, this can't be happening on my first day of work as a professional. Um, and I, so I get, I run, throw my stuff together, jump in the car. I'm speeding towards the location they gave me. I get pulled over by a police officer, get a speeding ticket on my way to work, apologize profusely, continue on. I get there two and a half, almost three hours late to my first day of work. And everybody's just, literally, I'm walking through the set to get to the makeup trailer, and everyone's sitting on boxes. You know, like, nobody's working. They're just waiting for the new guy to show up. It was it was a, the nightmare, the nightmare you have as an actor. Um, all that crew, all those cameras, all that sound. Thousands, I would say millions of dollars, but things were cheaper then. So hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent because of me. I was shocked and horrified and felt so shitty, but everyone was so polite and so great. And David Simon, who created the show, came into the trailer as I was, you could tell he was not impressed at all, but he was kind enough to say, you know, forget about it. Don't worry about it. Go do your work. We need you, you know, focus in and get this right. They could probably tell, by the way, you, you didn't walk in going like, that's right, that's right. <laughs> I certainly wasn't proud of myself. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's wait, for, wait around. You know what I mean? for sure. They could probably tell you were contrite, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they, they, I think they could tell I was shell-shocked and yeah. felt sh- terrible. And they didn't want me to feel that. They wanted me to feel, you know, like my character. It, doesn't that speak so, to, the, to the environment on that set then? It was, it was an amazing, amazing group of people. The, the biggest shout-out I want to give that I always give that is, you know, David Simon obviously created the most amazing canvas for a television show that we have seen in modern times. But a name that doesn't get batted around a lot is Alexa Fogel, who cast the show. Mm. And that group of actors, you know, it was like such a dream to work with all those people because nobody nobody was trying to show anybody else up. Nobody was trying to do too much. Everybody knew what they had in the dialogue and knew that all you had to do was show up and say the words and get out of the way. And that level of um, lack of ego and just getting to work and treating it as a job, which it is, Mm. was, you know, for that to be your big introduction to the industry, it's hard to live up to, we'll put it that way. I want to play one one more clip before we go. 498, interfering with a staff member in performance of duties. Didn't your boyfriend teach you how to treat a staff member floppy tits? That's a shot! Hey! What's on your shirt there, pig pen? Shit? Tears? Potato chips? 3.30, being unsanitary. Shot! I don't like your face. 3.12, insolence. Shot! Mendez is back. back. Bitches. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if you remember your Bubble Boy lines that well. That is my that is my guest, Pablo Schreiber, playing the character George oh. Pornstash Mendez on the smash hit Netflix show Orange is the New Black. A similar phenomenon when it when it was released. Are, are, do you get the same feeling after being on The Wire, which is again widely considered to be one of the greatest TV shows of all time? Orange is the New Black also gets brought into that sort of prestige TV greatest conversations. When you go on to that set, do you start getting a similar feeling like, oh, this thing has the same kind of legs? No, it was similar in the sense that nobody had any idea what it was going to be. Oh, I thought you were going to see the similar like I was late again. No, no. no thank God. <laughs> I learned my lesson. I never showed up late again, hopefully, you know, for all the years I'm an actor. Um, no, no one knew it, what it was going to be. Yeah, it was similar because it was Netflix's second show. They had made House of Cards. Right. Yeah. That right, was it. right back when was we the were like very beginning the, the, of the, Netflix. The, the essentially TV rental company is going to start making their own stuff. That was it, and people were like, "What? Who is this company? What are they doing?" 
I read the scripts. I love Jenji Cohen, who I had done an arc on weeds, and that's why she hired me for that. But I read the script, and I was like, I don't get it. I don't know who the audience for this is going to be. A show about women's prison? Like, who's going to watch this? You know, this is an appointment television. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it came out, and it was like, oh, yeah, this is definitely appointment television. Because it was the beginning of the thing that we see now, which is that there's an audience for everything, right? All the streaming services want something that covers all the bases. Right. right? And... It was an audience that had been neglected and right. wasn't getting content, so they were incredibly eager to have content that spoke to them. And you see that now on all the streaming services, people making content specific to audience groups. And it was in the early days of Netflix, and it just just took off. So um, I'm obviously incredibly grateful to Genji for having me there because it provided it provided the second like post in my career, right? It was, there was Nick, Nikki from the docks and then there was not much for a long, well, I went and did theater for a long time and that was great. And I had a whole moment there, ended up getting nominated for a Tony award in my Broadway debut, which was a, another kind of, um, wonderful moment, but, but TV kind of slowed down for a while. And, and right before I, I did Orange is the New Black, I had been on some network TV shows. I had just had my kids and I needed money mm -hmm. and I was on some shows that I really you know, wasn't super excited about yeah. it. I was just jobbing it. Right? And it's easy. Uh, network TV shows, often multicam, you can get it done in a day and you, they pay a ton of money too, right? Easy money. But it's not, for me, it's not ever, like I'm the kind of guy that I'd rather not work if I'm not working on something I really like. Right. So it was hard at the time. Yeah. But then Orange came out and, and got the kind of attention that provided this other thing. And I think because it was so different from the character in The Wire, mm. and it was uh, there was like comedy to it, so it kind of showed that I had comedic chops and could do that. Um, that it just allowed me now, you know, I wouldn't be here if, if it wasn't for Orange is the New Black, which is fantastic. It, it opened up a whole new door to me um, and allowed my allowed my career to continue, basically. <laughs> I mean, I can I can see, and maybe this is a good way to close things out. I can see the the. Um amount of, and I hope you take this in the way I mean it, the amount of thought you put into your, to your career and, in, and into your, to your work and how you, how you approach it. Um, you, you mentioned your dad was a, uh, an acting teacher, an acting mm. coach, an acting teacher. I mean, you, you, your brother, uh, uh, Lee, have also did, done incredibly well in, in this industry, which no one does well in. Yeah. Um, is there some, is there commonality? Did, you, did your dad give both of you a piece of advice that, like, is there something going on there? There's definitely something going on. I, I couldn't tell you what it is. Yeah, um, but it wasn't like, oh, he sat down, sat us both no. down one day and said, if you're going to get into this thing, you got to remember to... No, not at all, because, um, you know, Liev grew up on the East Coast. I grew up on the West Coast. He's six, uh, 10 years older than me. Uh, we didn't grow up together at all. So there, we have very little um, commonality other right. than the fact that we have the same dad. So right. like genetics is really all you get. Right. But there's definitely something happening there. And maybe in the way, you know, that he spoke to us, there's something... My dad was a very, um, uh, in in the best way possible, he was he was kind of a judgmental guy, and he wasn't easy to please. Um, but you really wanted his yeah. approval, you yeah. know, real bad. Yeah. And from other people I've seen that have that dynamic with their father, that it it's really drives you to do something great. Yeah. And I think we both ended up with that. Like nothing was quite good enough, so we just work really, really hard to be better. Yeah. I don't know. You do. You do. I was struck by something you said when you were talking about the way the wire worked, and I find that um, folks who have either actor parents. Mm. Um, Say say similar things to me. Everyone on the set treated it like a job. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was a job. We were passionate about it. We loved it, but we knew we were there to do a job. Yeah, and I think there's a, there's a beauty in that. Yeah. You know, like just showing up to just do your job. Yeah, right. Do your job. Do it well. Mm -hmm. Really, like you know, as hard as you can. Focus and and bring everything you can to it. But also have the sense of. Uh, uh, separating yourself from the thing and taking your ego out of it and just allowing it to be what it is, which is you're showing up for work. Oh, man, what a, what a joy to talk to you. Do you still, Canadian, do you still, how do you feel about the Canadian-ness I put on you? Do you still feel Canadian? I love Canada. I really do. You know, I think, um, it, there's, I left when I was 12, so there's a huge part of me, I've been living down there for a long time, right. there's a huge part of me that is probably really American. But to me, there's like a, there's a real sort of decency and goodness that comes from being Canadian um, that I hold on to pretty dearly, you know, and, and I never want to not feel like that. We're going to get you on the five one of these days. Hey. That's what we're going to do. We're going to get you on the, we're going to get you on the, lovely to meet you. Thanks for coming yeah, in. Yeah, pleasure, Tom. Thanks so much.